This morning, before we uh, get into God's Word, um, I would like for us to just have a time of a prayer for our nation, as well as for those who are currently serving uh, in our military uh, all abroad our world, and as well as for those, of course, who paid the ultimate sacrifice for us as a nation and who gave their life for our freedoms just this morning, especially pray for the families of those. And um, I was just reminded a moment ago, we actually lost, uh, I say lost, I don't like to use that, I don't even know why I do, but one of our own church members who was a military veteran passed away this year, Brother Lawrence McCall. And uh, certainly we want to just remember those family of those servicemen. I've asked our chairman of deacons, James Hans, if he would come. He is also a military veteran, a member of our church, and if he would lead us in that prayer this morning. So James, Let's do this. Let's stand just in honor. Let's pray. Dear Lord, it says in your word that no greater love is man than to give his life for his fellow man. And today we're here to honor and recognize those that have done that very thing. Dear Lord, we know that, that Israel is your chosen people, but dear Lord, we know that America has been blessed by you. We've enjoyed a period of prosperity and peace that no other nation has ever had. And do we know it's only through your blessings and your grace and your providence that this is possible. Do we come here today and we ask that you would just bless those families whose loved ones have given their life to this country, Lord. Those that have passed away in service to this nation. We just ask that you would comfort their souls, that, that they can realize that their loved ones have performed a noble and honorable sacrifice, Lord. And that it's a holy duty that we're called to love one another, even unto death. Do we just ask that you would bless this nation. Once again, we would turn our eyes to you and recognize that you are the source of our greatness, of our resources, of our wealth, of our peace, and our prosperity, Lord. Dear Lord, we're just truly blessed to live here. We know that it's by your grace that we are here. Dear Lord, we just ask a special blessing on those that are serving, those that are in the states, and those that are stationed overseas, Lord. We just ask for your protection for them. We just ask for your grace for them. And we just ask that your Holy Spirit would comfort them as they are so far away from home, doing their duty, Lord. We just ask that you would bless the leaders of this nation, that they would make wise decisions, that they would turn to you for guidance and recognize that no matter what power they may think they have, you are the ultimate ruler. And dear Lord, that they would recognize that. Lord, we just ask that you would bless each member here, Lord. Just bless these families. Help us to serve you, Lord. And just help us to recognize that it's through sacrifice that we serve you. That each one is called to take up their cross and to serve you. And the Lord, this day honors those who have done that for this nation. Lord, we just ask your blessing on us. We just ask for your continued protection and peace. For it is in Christ's name that I pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Several weeks back, uh, many of you I know noticed the appearance of this flag up here behind me. And, and I mentioned when it first went up that I was saving the message related to that flag for today, for this weekend especially. And the story behind this flag is probably a, a little known story. Uh, it's actually about the creation of our nation's first flag, really just before we actually became a nation. Uh, the flag that was recognized uh, in many instances, especially during the Revolutionary War before the current Stars and Stripes was actually sewn together by Betsy Ross in 1776. And this is known as, of course, the Appeal to Heaven flag. In the summer of 1775, the American colonies were actually in turmoil. And of course, many of you know the history behind it, King George, I had actually declared that the colonies were in rebellion under British rule there. And of course, war had begun. And the First Continental Congress actually appointed unanimously George Washington as the general to lead the colonial forces on July 3rd, 1775, to wage war against the most powerful nation on earth at the time. And that was Great Britain. Washington quickly realized that the naval vessels, there must be naval vessels commissioned in order to intercept the British ships that were sent into battle as well as to bring in supplies for the British troops. 
Well, shortly afterwards, there were six schooners that entered into the service, and most likely it is said that these first ships were actually funded out of Washington's own pocket. And this became known as Washington's Secret Navy. And the ships needed a flag to actually fly under, but none existed at the time, of course. But after careful consideration, Washington decided to affix the words, Appeal to Heaven, on a white background, and then he sewed a large green pine tree right in the center. And of course, this is what you see here today, known as the Appeal to Heaven flag. And those words, Appeal to Heaven, actually were influenced by a work written by a man by the name of John Locke. He was a, a leading political philosopher of the day. And Locke argued that once a people had exhausted every possible means of redress in conflict with a sovereign entity, that they were then permitted to appeal to heaven for the rectitude of their cause. This same belief was also later phrased in our Declaration of Independence with these words, appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions. So convinced were these early colonists of the rightness of their cause that, of course, they cried out to God to intervene on their behalf. This appeal to heaven flag was also known as Washington's cruiser flag, and it flew all those six schooners as they were launched. Well, just a few months after their first voyage, a British ship by the name of Nancy, which I thought was interesting, don't know where that came from, but by the name of Nancy was captured by one of our schooners that was called the Lee. And on board that ship, that British ship, were muskets, were flint, gunpowder, and other supplies to last our armed forces during that time, our Revolutionary Forces, to last them for a full year. This turned out to be one of the greatest captures of the entire Revolution. And it certainly inspired all of our founding fathers, and it also eventually inspired the birth of what we know now as the United States Navy. The Appeal to Heaven flag was also known to be flown on floating batteries, on riverbanks and towns. It was flown in battlefields like Bunker Hill and in places of very important significance like our nation's capital of the time in Philadelphia. And it was reported that Washington actually carried this flag in every single battle that he fought in. The pine tree during that time was also known as the tree of peace, and it had long been known as a symbol of very importance for those early colonies. Some thousand years before on this land, there existed a very troubling and conflicted time among six Iroquois Indian tribes. Well, a peacemaker actually ended up bringing the tribes together to work out their differences and a peace treaty was negotiated and agreed upon. And these talks actually took place under a giant pine tree. And it was there where legend has it that these tribes literally buried their war hatchets. Thus the phrase, bury the hatchet. Legend also has it that during that time there was a powerful bald eagle clutching in its claws six arrows and it perched itself on top of that tree in order to guard it. Today, the American Eagle on our nation's seal has 13 arrows clutched in its claws. The tree then served as a powerful symbol of unity and of reconciliation. You know, as I've told this story, I believe it should stand as an inspiration for all future generations of Americans. I believe it also should stand as an inspiration for all American Christians, that we need to come together in unity, we need to bury our hatchets, and we need to appeal to heaven for help. Certainly for our nation, but I believe we need to appeal to heaven for our own cause, for the church, for the cause and the sake of Jesus Christ. Should we not lay aside those issues that divide us? 
Should we not bury our hatchets of racial, political, denominational, and generational differences? I think we need to remember and seriously heed the words that our Lord and Savior spoke when He said, No city or house divided against itself will stand. And I think now, today, more than ever, we need to abide by these words that if we humble ourselves, if we seek His face, if we turn from our wicked ways, then God will hear from heaven and He will forgive our sins and He will heal our land. But the first requirement of that is to humble ourselves and seek His face. If you'll turn with me to the 33rd chapter of Psalms, I want to just real quickly this morning, I want to look at the question that I know I've heard some people ask. Has God abandoned America? Has God deserted America? Well, certainly, I do not believe He has. I do believe God has certainly blessed America. I think we all can agree upon that. I do also believe that God is continuing to bless America, but I also do believe that in many ways God may be judging America at this time. And so I want to look at just three things this morning once we read this passage. I want us to remind ourselves, what has God done for America? What is God doing for America? And what will God do for America? But look at this passage, beginning in the 8th verse, 33rd chapter of Psalms. It says, Let all the earth fear the Lord, let all the people of the world revere Him. For He spoke and it came to be, He commanded and it stood firm. And the Lord foils the plans of the nations, He thwarts the purposes of the peoples, but the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of His heart for all generations. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people He chose for His inheritance. From heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From His dwelling place He watches all who live on earth. He who forms the hearts of all, who considers everything they do. No king is saved by the size of his army. No warrior escapes by his great strength. A horse is a vain hope for deliverance. Despite all its great strength, it cannot save. But the eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. We wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. And in Him our hearts rejoice, for we trust in His holy name. May Your unfailing love rest upon us, O Lord, even as we put our hope in You. So what has God done for America? The first thing God has done for America is He has birthed America. We would not be here as a nation, I believe, if it wasn't for God's sovereignty and God's providence. As a matter of fact, in this 8th verse, we just read here that He spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. Now certainly, the psalmist here is speaking of all the world, but if that's all the world, then that certainly includes America as well. I don't believe our founding fathers just founded our nation just because they were under British oppression and, and, and under heavy taxation by the Britons. I believe it was all part of God's sovereignty and part of God's plan and God's providence that the United States of America is built today. President George Washington said these words. He said, it's impossible to govern the world without God and the Bible. Of all dispositions and habits that lead to political prosperity, our religion and morality are indispensable supporters. Patrick Henry, who was a member of that First Continental Congress and also governor of Virginia, he said these words, It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. That this great nation was founded not on religions, but it was founded upon the gospel of Jesus Christ. You know, in Jamestown, Virginia, one of those first colonies, you know the very first building that was built there was a church. William Penn, who was a 
huge influence behind the establishment of the states of Pennsylvania, New York, Delaware, Connecticut, North Carolina, South Carolina, and even our own state of Georgia. In writing government policies for Pennsylvania early on, he made sure that in those policies it stated that all treasurers, judges, and all elected officials profess faith in Jesus Christ. Don't know we would have many to elect today if that was the case. So God, under his providence and sovereignty, God birthed America. Also, the other thing God has done for America, he has blessed America. In our some 240 years, if I figured that right, do you realize there has been no prolonged war on our homeland other than the Revolutionary War and the Civil War? I mean, certainly, we've had attacks on our homeland, Pearl Harbor, of course, 9-11. But no prolonged conflicts of war right here on our land, including both world wars. That was not a blessing of God, I don't know what is. According to 2015 gross domestic product, do you know that our nation is the wealthiest country with almost $18 trillion? We won't talk about the debt, but that's just gross domestic product. China comes in second with just under $11 trillion. Japan comes in third with approximately $4 trillion. Do you know it is said that the U.S. is home to the largest number of billionaires in the world? As a matter of fact, some people believe that it's estimated more billionaires actually live in the U.S. than all the rest of the world. So what has God done for America? Well, we're here because of God. We're still in existence because of God. He birthed us. But also God has blessed America. And I don't believe anybody in this place today would deny that. So what is God doing for America? Well, it says here that from heaven the Lord looks down and sees all mankind. From his dwelling place, he watches all who live on earth. So I believe one thing God is doing for America, he's watching over America. Do you realize that in our country there is a murder about every 24 minutes? A forcible rape about every seven minutes, robberies every 68 seconds, aggravated assault every 51 seconds, a violent crime occurs about every 27 seconds, and a major crime is committed about every three seconds. You know, it's a wonder we haven't destroyed ourselves. But I believe it's only because God is watching over us and God is protecting us. You know, today... In our country, there are more churches than ever. But kind of on the negative side of that, there are more churches in our country closing their doors more than ever. There's more corruption than ever, certainly, in our government, in businesses, even, I hate to say it, but even in our churches. But God is still watching over America. The other thing I believe God is doing for America, He's still being patient with America. You know, God has given us the answer for our nation. God has given us the answer for the whole world. And it's not government, certainly. It's not religion, certainly. It is His Son, Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. He is the only answer. You know, Jesus himself said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. He did not say, I am one of. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You see, Jesus is the way for people who are seeking some direction in their life, for people who are lost, who are wandering around in this life with no purpose. Jesus is the way. He is the only way. Jesus is the truth. Speaking to those who, who are educated, the intellects of this world, who think they have the answer for our nation and for our world. But Jesus is the truth. He is the only truth, the absolute truth. Only truth can be found in Him. And Jesus is the life for those people who 
are still daily, if we come in contact, each and every one of us come in contact with them each and every day, people who are dying in sin. And if they were to leave this world tomorrow, they would spend eternity in hell apart from God. People who are searching for something worth living for. Now we might think America is crumbling. And, and in some ways it seems to be, and it might be. But the reason why it's crumbling is because we have simply just turned away from God. We have turned away from the way, the truth, and the life. And I believe in many cases, and I'm not only just talking to you people as the church, I'm talking to myself as the church. I believe in many cases the church of Jesus Christ has failed to change that through the power and the strength of the Holy Spirit. But rest assured, I believe God is still working in America today. I believe God is being patient with America today. And I believe God will continue to be patient as long as there is one heart, there is one soul in our nation that will turn to Him. So what will God do in America? Well, it's up to America. It's up to Americans. I believe it's more importantly up to the church in America. as to what God will do in America. Romans 14, 12 tells us that each of us will give an account of himself to God. That means that each and every believer, you and I, in this place this morning, one day we will stand before our Lord and Savior and give an account. That also means that each and every person in the United States of America one day will stand before Jesus Christ and will have to give an account. That means that everybody in the world one day will stand before Him and have to give an account. The prophet Isaiah God told him, he said, As surely as I live, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. And we know also the passage that every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now notice that does not say every believer will. That says every knee, every tongue, every tribe, language, people, race, Everyone one day will bow and confess Jesus Christ is Lord. And when Paul quoted this statement in his letter to the Romans, you know, that was written and given to the prophet Isaiah some 750 years before. And that statement, every knee will bow and every tongue confess, is still true some 3,000 years later after the prophet Isaiah. See, folks, when God is working in a nation, God is also working in the people of that nation. And as we've talked about this morning, what God has done, what God is doing, and what He will do, I want each and every one of us to think, especially on this Memorial Day weekend, I want us to ask ourselves those three questions. First of all, what has God done in my life today? Of course, God's done a lot of things for me. And I know many of you can say the same thing. But ultimately, what God has done for you is sacrifice His only Son for you to have life abundant and life everlasting. 1 John 5, 12 tells us, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. <laughs> There's no other Bible translation or paraphrase or whatever that can say that more simply. He who has the Son of God has life. He who does not, does not have life. There is no in-between. There is no right in the fence there. So what is God doing for you? Well, one thing I know, God is present with you always. Every single day. Extending to each one of us His forgiveness. Extending to us His mercy. Extending to us His grace through His Son, Jesus Christ. What will God do for you? It's completely up to you. It's completely up to you 
and your willingness to trust Him, to follow Him, and to be obedient to Him and to His Word. Paul, when he wrote his letter to the Corinthians, the second letter, as a matter of fact, he told the believers there in the early church there, he said, as workers together with Him, I also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I believe there are too many in our churches today who may have received God's grace, but it's really made no impact, no change. It's really had no transforming effect on their life. And you can go to any church today and see how many are sitting in those churches on Sunday morning, but how many are actually attending those churches on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. Many of them, I believe, have just received God's grace in vain. It has not made any difference in their life. And Paul says, I plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. I believe one reason why our nation may be crumbling and falling today is because too many in the church have received God's grace in vain. It's not made a difference. And then he goes on to say, For he says, in an acceptable time, I have heard you. And in the day of salvation, I have helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. It's today. It's today for anybody in this place who has never personally surrendered their heart and life to Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Today is the day of salvation. It's today even for our nation. God says, in the appointed time, in the accepted time, I've heard you, in the accepted time, I've helped you. It is today. But it's all up to us, folks. It's completely up to you. It's completely up to me. It's completely up to the church as to what God will do in our nation from this day forward. It's completely up to you as to what God will do in your life from this day forward. Let me pray.